This is different, folks. I want you all to know that I was thinking coming in here today, preparing for this or thinking about this, that even though you're not here in this room today, we're all here because we have the same spirit of our Lord in us. He's in me, he's in you. And I'm glad you're with us here today. When I was asked to do this, I got to thinking about something that happened earlier. It was Tuesday of this week. After spending, gosh, all day Sunday afternoon and all day Monday, like many of you probably did, driving around, gathering up all whatever I could find that was or was not on shelves, trying to think of what to do and what's going on. And, and I admit a little panic maybe. Uh, I was sitting there at the house Tuesday morning about all oh, 20 to 10 or something Eastern time because I was watching the news, getting the numbers on this coronavirus and just seeing, how, oh my goodness, just in these few days how it's multiplied. And then I thought about that. I'm sitting in the chair. Then I flip over to the business channel and news is worse there, or not worse, but same, more of the, the same old thing. The market was crashing and, I sit, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, oh my, oh my goodness, what, what's going on with us? What's going on with our world right now? And I glanced over from my chair and I looked over and I saw my, my son's dog, Socks, and you're, you're, you can see that. And as I looked at there and I saw automatically Matthew 6, 26 came into my brain. I looked over at Socks and said, oh my goodness. Now there is somebody that's truly not worried or there's a creature that God made that's truly not worried. In Matthew 26, the Spirit put it in my heart, and it reads, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And I literally laughed sitting in my chair as I looked over that dog, and that scripture came to my brain, and I said, God, I got you. I hear you. I thank you for that, dear God. So as we go and we think today about Jesus on the cross, how we're, he looks at us as being so valuable that he was willing to get on that cross for us, and that cross was meant for us. So we, as bow with me today as we take this communion together to remember what Jesus did for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for loving us. I thank you, Father, that we are valuable to you and we are heirs to your throne, Father, because of what Jesus did for us. And dear God, as we take this bread today, let us remember his body that was hung on that cross and broken for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you bow with me again? Father, this emblem, this juice, this fruit of the vine, dear Lord, what a simple thought, but how important it is, Father. We thank you for this, dear God. Dear Lord, as we take this today, let us remember the blood that was shed on that cross. Dear God, that cross that was meant for us and your son was willing to die for us. And we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Please pray for the speaker with me. Father, right now I lift up Todd. I thank you for the vision that you've given him for this church. I ask you to give him strength, power, and understanding to teach your word. I pray that we use this lesson to honor and glorify you and your name. I pray for peace, not only in our country, but in the world. Through difficult times, 
you have a plan, and we need to remember that. I pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Grant. Good morning, church. We will start as we always do. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, please be turning to the book of James. For the past several Sundays, church, we have talked about the fact, the fact that we all have trials and temptations and tribulations in our lives. And church, we've talked about how these trials, these trials that we face, they strengthen us and they make us more like Jesus. And now that James has told us how these trials can be, let me restate that. How these trials of various kinds, how they they will come, and how they will be beneficial to our lives. Well, James ends chapter 1 with an explanation of how we are to prepare to be able to withstand these, these unwelcome events in our lives. Let me pause there for a moment and tell you, tell you a little bit about today's sermon. Today's lesson is going to be a little different than most of my sermons. You know, it's easy to talk about our trials. And it's easy to, to talk about how we respond to those trials. But church, as I was spending time this week in these latter verses of James chapter 1, the Spirit led me to these words. Not my illustrations, not my stories, not not videos I find on YouTube. But church, this morning I want to let the Holy Spirit, through James, speak to us and minister to us. Help us prepare for these trials that we're facing today. Help us to prepare for the trials that we will continue to face in our lives. You know, there are times for us not to to read God's Word and instantly say, this is what I think that means. You know, I find myself doing that all the time. This is what I think James meant when he said that. This is how this is relevant to our lives in today's age. Church, there are times that we just need to hear the Word and let the Word, let the Holy Spirit make it clear. And that's exactly what we're going to do this morning as we go through these latter verses of James chapter 1. Now last week we talked specifically about how it's our option. That it's about how we respond to the trials and the temptations that we're faced with. It's how we pick the correct response. We pick the right path. How we pick that narrow path, not the easy path or the broad path, not the path that the world would more likely choose. And now James is going to lay out for us to to let us know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, there are several preparations that we need to be making in order to overcome trials and temptations that we're going to be faced with. And church, without these preparations, temptation can't be conquered. So today we're going to dig in and we're going to look at the advice that James gives us. The advice that we find here in James chapter 1. And we'll be starting in verse 19 this morning. So if you would get your Bibles out, turn to James 1 chapter 19. I'll be reading verses 19 through 21. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let every person be quick to hear. Let every person be slow to speak. Let every person be slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. James starts out here in verse 19 by by telling us to be quick to hear the Word of God. But church, the payoff, the end game of these three words is seen in verse 21. Receiving the Word so that a person's soul will be saved. 
You know, the greatest temptation in the world is for a person to walk through this life doing what he or she wants. Doing what he or she pleases. And therefore rejecting God's will for their life. Well, let me remind you what we talked about last week. Where James says in verse 15 that living a life like that, the result of a life like that, one where we follow our own desires, the result of that is death. And if a person is to be saved, if he or she is to be delivered from those temptations that will surely doom their soul, they must prepare themselves. They must be quick to hear the Word of God. They must make sure that they hear the Word of God. That leads to an obvious question. How can a person make sure that they hear the Word of God? Well, James makes it clear here in these verses, these three verses, verses 19 through 21, where he lays out five things for us. Five things that we must do to hear the Word of God. First, number one, and these are in your handout, and and included in the email that we send out this week, that we sent out on Saturday, is a little Word document that's your handout for this week. So you can go to that handout, you can print that out, Pause me if you need to do that, or or, or you can just take the words in. But the handout's there if you want to write this down. Number one on that, the first thing we need to do to make sure that we hear the Word of God is that we must be slow to speak. This means that a person must be willing to listen instead of speaking their own ideas about right or wrong or about how a person is to be saved. He must sit and listen Instead of hanging on to their own ideas, he must be willing to listen to God's word instead of insisting what he thinks. Secondly, he must be slow to wrath or slow to anger. There are two things that this covers. A person must not react against what God says about temptation or sin, nor about what God says about salvation. We talked about this last week. Our challenge is to respond, is to take time, is to think through God's Word and not react to our situation or react to what we read. Church, a person who reacts against God's plan of salvation and follows their own plan is dooming themselves. You can't be saved and you can't conquer temptation if you react in anger against God's Word. The second thing James tells us here is that a person must not be angry or act against others in wrath. Anger and wrath disturb and distract. An angry person can't focus his thoughts on the Spirit. An angry person can't focus their thoughts on God's Word. Church, the third thing we must do to be sure to hear the Word of God is to put aside all filthiness. The the picture that comes to my mind here is that of taking off a dirty garment and putting it aside, getting it away from us. If a person enjoys the dirt and the filth, then their mind's going to be focused on that. Their minds will not be clear, at least not clear enough to hear the Word of God. And it's interesting when you dig into James here in, in the Greek. And the Greek word that James uses for filth It's the word rupos, which sometimes, well, most of the time refers to the the wax in one's ear. So the picture James presents here is, is descriptive to say the least. A person with wax in their ear can't hear the word of God clearly. So he must take the wax out of his ear and put it away or else he'll be deaf to the word of God. Brothers and sisters, what James is saying here is if something is keeping you from hearing the Word of God, you've got to remove it from yourself. You've got to get it away from yourself. Church, don't let anything stand in your way of hearing the Word of God. Fourthly, a person must set aside all that remains of evil. Even after putting aside all moral filthiness, there's going to be evil that comes from within us. So we've got to be aware of this. We've got to put these remains off. James says we need to lay them aside. And the fifth way to make sure that you hear the Word of God 
is that we must receive the Word of God with humility. We must be as a child before God. Now, growing up in the church, we've talked about being like that of a child. We talked about that when we did our study on Mark, of having the heart of a child. And all my life, as I, as I heard these words over and over again, I always pictured the young Christian, the immature Christian, needing to be like a child to absorb the, the lessons of God. I don't think that's what James intends here. I think James is speaking to the young Christian, but James is also speaking to the mature Christian, those who, who know the word well, when he says, sit before him humbly, just as a child does their father, the idea here in James Church is that we must be humble and gentle and quiet and attentive in listening to the Word of God. And when we sit before God like this, we discover a most wonderful thing. I want to direct your attention to a word in verse 21, the word planted. The Greek word used here it means to implant. Or to be born within. When a person listens and hears the Word of God, it's planted within their heart and planted within their life. When God says, what God says is actually born within their heart. And when that happens, the person hears exactly what God is saying. So this first preparation we need to make to face trials, to withstand temptations, we must be quick to hear the Word of God. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you at least one story. So let me, let me go ahead and pull that one out here. One illustration on hearing the Word of God. So there's an American Indian. And he left his reservation to, to go with a buddy to New York City. And he was walking down 42nd Street, coming up on Broadway. A very busy street. And he suddenly stopped and he said, Listen, I hear a cricket. His friend said, man, you're crazy. There's no way you can hear a cricket within all this noise. And the Indian said, listen, I hear that cricket. His friend said, dude, it's noon. There are thousands of people around. There are cars honking. There are taxis squealing. I don't believe you can hear a cricket in all this. The Indian listened again. And then he took his friend across the street to a cement planter in front of a hotel. He raised up the bush that was there and pulled, across, pulled aside the leaves. And there it was, a cricket. His friend said, wow, you have amazing hearing. And the Indian said, no. My ears are no different than yours. It simply depends on what you're listening to. Here, let me show you. And the Indian reached in his pocket and he grabbed a handful of change. And he dropped it there on the cement. And all the people within 30 or 40 feet of him turned when they heard that noise. And the Indian said to his friend, you see what I mean? It all depends on what you're listening for. Church, the reason we're not hearing Jesus speak is because we're, not lis is because we're listening to the sounds of this world. And we're not tuned to the sounds of God's Word. Let's continue on in verse 22. I'll be reading verse 22 through 25, again from the English Standard Version. But be doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and he goes away, and at once... He forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the one who looks into the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but being a doer who acts, that person will be blessed in their doing. So the first thing, the first preparation we need to make is to hear the Word of God. And church, the second preparation we need to make is to do the Word of God. Church, don't be a hearer only. James tells us it's not enough to hear and know the Word of God. But brothers and sisters, we must live and do the Word of God. 
And you know, I, I love it when I hear people repeating throughout the, the week things that we talked about on a Sunday morning in the sermon, where they heard the word, but now they're thinking about how to implement that in their daily lives. So James makes it easy for us here. He gives us three points in this Scripture. Three points about doing. Number one, again, these are on your your, your fill-in, in your handout. The person who only hears and knows the Word deceives himself. If, If a person thinks that he can hear and learn the Word of God and then go out and live the life that they want, they deceive themselves. You know, there are many who hear the Word week after week. And they learn and they know as much about the Word as anyone. And they think that their listening and their learning makes them acceptable to God. They feel it makes them safe and secure. And then when they slip into sin, they feel they can ask God for forgiveness and that He'll forgive them. They just feel that God would never reject them. But I want you to note what what James says here. The most critical fact. Church, God doesn't accept us because we hear and know the Word. God doesn't accept us because we confess our sins. And, And don't take me wrong, these things are important. But these alone aren't enough. Church, God accepts us because we confess and we repent. That means we turn away from our sins. And we turn to God. God accepts us because we turn to Him and we live for Him. And when we believe God, when we really believe God, church, it's in that belief that we trust Him and we follow Him. And we do exactly what He tells us to do. The second point James makes here in these Scriptures is that the person who only hears and knows the Word they will soon forget what they've heard. Because if a person doesn't practice what they learn, it soon fades from memory. It's just forgotten. And it never becomes a part of that person's life. They're like the man who looks in the mirror and sees if they they need anything to fix their appearance. And then they walk away. And then they think of something else. And then they forget about that messed up hair or that pimple on their face, the things that needed to be cared for. And that happens so often in our lives where we hear the Word and we're convicted of some defect, some shortcoming that we have in our life, some failure that we need to clean up. And you know what? I I hear this all the time. As a matter of fact, I hear this just about every week after a sermon as I'm walking down the aisle or I'm in the fellowship hall where someone says to me, Boy, Todd, You were preaching right at me today. Todd, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me today. Your sermon, it hit me right here between the eyes. But you know too often, church, after we make those statements, as soon as we walk out from under the Word, we're distracted by the world. We're distracted by the affairs of the world. And we soon forget to do what the Word of God told us to do. Church, let's be doers of the Word. The third point James makes here on being a doer is that the person who hears and does the Word of God, that they will be blessed. The Word of God will free a person from all temptations and will give them a full and victorious life that our soul longs for. And that's a life which will give us an eternity with God. Church, a person who hears and does and lives the Word of God will find that they're freed from all that enslaves them here on this earth. Church, the Word of God is the law that gives freedom. It's the law that sets men free to know God and to have fellowship with God forever. But the critical point of this scripture here, verses 22 through 25, is that we have to continue in the Word of God. We have to continue to live just as it says. And if we do, well, then we'll be blessed. 
Let's move on to verse 26. Chapter 1 and verse 26. Honestly, church, I'd like to stop right here. I'd like to, if it were up to me, my preference, let's just skip verse 26 and move right on to verse 27. Because I struggle with verse 26 in my life. It's one of the greatest struggles I have that keeps me from living the life that God wants me to live. Verse 26. If anyone thinks he's religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, that person deceives his heart. Church, that person's religion is worthless. It's worthless. So preparation number three that James give us, gives us is to control the tongue. To keep a tight rein on the tongue. And if a person thinks he's religious, that, that is, they think they're acceptable to God, and then they don't keep a tight rein on their tongue, you're lying to yourself. No matter what they think, no matter what you profess, James lays it out, church, your religion is empty. And don't take these words lightly. The word used here for religion and religious, they describe a person who's very religious, who gives great attention to religion and is very faithful in their religious worship and service. If that person's loose with their tongue, if they like to interrupt and dominate conversation, if they're easily provoked and lash out at others, if they like to gossip and tell tales, if they find themselves criticizing and judging and condemning others, using slang and cursing, engaging in off-color and suggestive talk, if they like to talk down others or run down others, church, no matter what a person thinks, no matter what they do, if they don't keep a tight rein on their tongue, that person deceives themselves and their religion is empty. Church, they don't please God and they're unacceptable to God. James makes it plain and simple, church. For a person to withstand and conquer temptation, we must control our tongue. Verse 27. James 1 and 27, again from the English Standard Version. Religion that's pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Church, preparation number four for conquering temptation is to practice pure religion. Visit the needy and keep yourselves from being polluted by the world. James talks about these two things as necessities for preparing against trials. A person must visit orphans and widows in their affliction. This would certainly include visiting those who are orphaned, widowed, those who are shut in, th those who are newcomers, those who are lost and unsaved, those who are bedridden and lonely and grieved, those who are fatherless and motherless. Church, whatever the need, God expects us to take care of it. He expects us to reach out into our community. A task that really isn't that difficult. But let me tell you, one way where I've seen many, many churches in the past miss this is they've only applied these scriptures to those within their family, those within their congregation. And I don't think that's what James is telling us right here. I don't think that's what God through the Holy Spirit is telling us to do in verse 27. So what if we were to do this? Let, let's say within a quarter mile radius of this building, there were 250 homes. What if we canvassed this area, canvassed, canvassed this quarter mile radius to see how many homes contained people that fit the description here? In verse 27. And then what if we committed to make sure that these people received visits? That their core needs were taken care of? 
And as we go, explain. All we're doing is to share Christ and share our church to see if we can be any help to, to any part of their family. Again, all it gets back to, church, is showing our community that we really care. The second thing James says here in verse 27 is that a person must keep themselves from being polluted by the world. So let me ask you a question. How easy is it to be polluted by the world? Church, pure religion doesn't become corrupted with false beliefs. Pure religion doesn't become corrupted with false religion. It holds to the purity of the gospel and the word of God. Church, pure religion doesn't focus on form. It doesn't focus on ritual. And it doesn't focus on ceremony. To the contrary, pure religion focuses on the power of God to change lives eternally. And that's what we're here for, church. That's what will keep us away from trials and temptations. Church, pure religion doesn't become morally corrupt. It doesn't become entangled with the affairs and the pleasures of this world. True religion stirs people to separate themselves from the things of this world. The things that arouse our fleshly desires. The things that arouse our cravings. Church, true believers of true religion keep themselves unspotted from the lust of the eyes. We keep ourselves unspotted from the lust of the flesh. We keep ourselves apart from the pride of life. The posting, the boasting of what we have, the boasting of what we do. Church, this, as James emphasizes, is a necessary preparation if a person's to conquer the temptations and the sins of this world. So let me quickly recap four things that James says, four preparations that we need to be doing daily to overcome and to withstand trials and temptations of this world. Number one, we've got to be quick to hear the Word of God. Number two, we've got to be a doer of the Word and not only a listener. Number three, we've got to control our tongue. And number four, we've got to practice pure religion. We've got to visit the needy. And we've got to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. And church, these things may seem trivial, but these are instructions from God's holy word. So let's take them to heart this morning. Will you pray with me, please? Dear God, our Father in heaven, again, we thank you for this book of James. We thank you for having the Spirit move us to look at this book of James four weeks ago. Back when the coronavirus was not a concern here in the U.S. Back when we didn't have tens or hundreds or thousands of deaths. Father, thank you for leading us down the path that you know we need to go. Father, it's our prayer this morning that we will be quick to hear the word. And Father, we'll not only be quick to hear the word, but as you've told us, we will be a doer of the word. Father, we pray that we will do the things that you've instructed us to do. To take care of those around us who are in need. And Father, it's our prayer at this time especially. As there are those within our congregation and those around our homes that we know need someone to lift them up. Need someone to to take them communion. They need someone to deliver them groceries. They need someone to pick up a meal for them. Father, we pray that you will do as, as you've instructed us here in James. And Father, we pray, and I pray this morning, that you'll help us control our tongues. It, it seems like such a trivial thing compared to, to reading the Word and doing the Word and taking care of those others around us. But God, it wouldn't be important. If it weren't important, you wouldn't have laid it out for us. 
Father, we pray that you'll help us control our tongues. We pray that you'll help us keeping ourselves from being polluted by the world. Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice for coming here on this earth. We thank you for his brother James and everything that his brother James has put in your word for us to benefit from. And Father, it's in Jesus' name that we pray this prayer this morning. Amen. Church, as we close this morning, we want to ask you, if you have any needs, if you need to, to, to spend any time with one of our elders in prayer, please don't hesitate this week to give them a call and spend time with them so that they can pray with you. If you have physical needs, if you need to be taken care of, please call any of us this week. Call myself. Send me an email. Send me a text. Reach out to Von Plunk, he's, who's heading up a, a ministry to make sure that everyone's taken care of. If you have any needs, please allow us to help you in those needs this week. Please stay in, please stay safe, and take care of yourself. Godspeed this week.